take a look at tonight. Uh, the first one, and, and I'm not a big proponent of the report card, so uh, I'll just put that on the table to start with. Um, I find it very ironic that even at the state level, um, I had the opportunity last week to go down um, and, and sit on, uh, many of you probably saw the article this morning or the board meeting on Monday, uh, I was invited to sit on the State Superintendent's Advisory Council uh, and to have the opportunity to sit there and listen to some of the things that are being said at the state level about the report card and the problems and issues with it. Um, the next two days, Tuesday and Wednesday, I was actually at the Superintendent's Conference down in Columbus also. Uh, and the Superintendent's Association also actually brought in a man by the name of Jack Tanner. And Jack is one of the foremost experts across the, the country in talking about education and educational data. And Jack spent an hour at that meeting telling us what's wrong with our state report. Uh, so I found it fairly ironic that the people that are kind of responsible for putting this stuff together are talking about the problems and issues. Uh, if you take a look at, at the Columbus Dispatch, a lot of the Cleveland newspapers, I can't say the countless number of articles that have been out over the course of the last month about some of the different issues and some of the different problems with the state report card, specifically the correlation to socioeconomic status and performance on the report card. And, and you'll see a couple of examples of that here tonight. We'll talk a little bit about that. So we are going to look at that and try not to spend too much time on that. Uh, state and district changes. So what are some of the mandates going on across the state? How have we responded to them as a district? Uh, state funding and local finances. I'm sure that that's the reason why some of you are here. Um, obviously, it, it's not legal for me to stand up here and, and push the levy on you, but it is legal for me to stand up here and give you information. Um, financial information, academic information, and, and why we have the needs that we have and why we are where we are. So we will discuss some of that tonight. Talk a little bit about some of the improved communication that's happened over the course of the last year, and real briefly, we're going to talk about future plans. It's really hard <coughs> to talk about future plans, we don't necessarily know what your financial future looks like. So we'll talk about that. So just a reminder, back in 2014-15, which is the year before I got here, <coughs> We were identified as a watch school based upon our data. We were an academic watch. We were in the lowest 10% of the state of Ohio. Uh, we were given three years under state supports to try and remove ourselves from that, to improve the things we had going on. Very proud to say, we talked about this last year, in three years we were able to remove ourselves out of that. So 18 and 19, we were independent status. I'm sorry, 17 and 18, we achieved independent status and we've maintained that. So the absolute highest level that we could achieve within the state, we've achieved that ranking and we've maintained it. So proud of that work that we've done here in the district. So here's our report. If you didn't look at it, it was released a couple weeks ago. Uh, we simply run through the grades. I'll run through each category, just kind of briefly explain what they mean. Because this doesn't mean a whole lot out of context, okay? It's kind of like the idea if I say to you, you know, how much is that? And you tell me, well, well it's 10. It's 10 what? It's 10 pounds, it's $10. It's without context to what you're talking about. Letters and numbers don't always necessarily mean anything. So we're trying to put this in context. So the first category up there, I know it's hard to see. So the upper left hand corner, that's achievement. We received a letter grade of a D. If you move across to the right, that's progress. I'll explain each one of these as you move forward. We received a C. Cap closing, so I'm down to the second category number, we received an A. Next to that is graduation rate, we received a B. The bottom left is K3 uh, improvement in reading, we received a B. And prepare for success is the lower right hand, which is an F. And you'll see at the very bottom there, you'll see the letter of C, that was our overall grade. Now, we all went to school, or at least most of us, I'm hoping. We all know what those letters mean, right? We have some context for that. When you look at that, C's are average, right? A's and B's are better than average. D's and F's are things we don't talk about, at least not my house, right? So we have some context there. So let's talk about how we earn those, because I don't think we necessarily understand that in regards to the education system. So here's the first category of achievement. We received a D in achievement. Achievement is nothing more than one snapshot or picture in time. This is how we do that one day when we take our state, attest our, our state achievement tests. Sorry about that. Okay, so it's one picture in time. Okay, when you look at this down here on the left side, and I know it's kind of hard, hard to see, but this area over here, 
This is the number of students that received at different levels, from advanced down to limited. They put that into a formula, they generate a number of points. There's 120 possible points that you can receive, and we received 87.5 of the possible 120, 72.9%, that's our performance index. We received a letter grade of a C. Chris, I thought you said achievement was a D. It was, there's another component to this, okay? It has to do with the number of indicators met. There are a number of indicators in grade levels three through uh, our sophomore year, and that has to do with the number of benchmarks that we reach. In the state of Ohio, those benchmarks are set at 80%, okay? We, we only reached two of our indicators this year, okay? So that's where, when you factor that in, that's where the D comes from. Over here on the right-hand side, if you look at this graph over here, this just kind of shows you the trend. So the first bar graph, and many of us don't necessarily like numbers, but colors and charts are, are okay, right? So I try to put as many of these in here as we can. So this first bar over here is 2015. You'll see that our index or our number of points was 86.9. So over the course of the next four years, you'll see that we're at 87.5. I'm okay with that. And when you look at that, you appreciate you really haven't gone up much. But here's the thing that I want you to understand. We're gonna talk a lot about this tonight is the change process, okay? Over the course of this time, we have seen in testing, okay? We were in the OGT test. The OGT test changed to the park exams. The park exams changed to the air and the EOC exams. We were doing this all paper pencil. That switched three years ago to on computers. We've been with the air and EOC test now for four years, and every year the tests have changed. Okay. So we're trying to hit a moving target. Okay. The good thing is we're not a district that teaches to the test. Okay. We focus on the standards, but it still makes it more difficult to understand what the test is looking like, what's the end result. Okay. It's kind of the idea of if we continue to move the goal line okay, on a football field, it'd be really hard to make that goal line, right? It's the same concept. So the fact that all of this change going on and we continue to make, maintain relatively high percentages, I, I'm relatively pleased with that. Okay? Is there always room for improvement? Absolutely. All right, so the next category is progress. We received a C in progress. Those of you who looked at last year's report card, which we're going to do in just a minute, know that we had to be here. Okay? We, went down, we went down a great level. Let's talk about what progress is. Progress is the component that looks closely at the growth that students make okay, basically over the course of the year. We look at their past performance based on what they currently do, we gauge that year's worth of growth, and we talk about whether or not we do this well. Okay? We talk about whether or not those students have grown. So there are four different categories here. Whoa, wrong one, I'm sorry. Okay? So we have our overall progress. We have gifted students. We have students in the lowest 20% in achievement. And we have students with disabilities. Okay? Four subgroups that we take a look at based on the state level. Okay? Those are four subgroups we have here within our district. So overall, I'm hitting the wrong button, sorry. Okay. This is all of our students and how they progress in math, ELA, and science using the testing grades four through eight and some of the end of course exams at the high school level. Okay. This is measuring growth. You're going to see in a few minutes in one of the charts that I have, you've got to think about this. Okay. Five years ago, we had a lot of room for growth. Okay. We've grown pretty well over the course of the last three or four years. Well, the higher you get to the top, the harder it is to grow, right? Okay, so kind of keep that in mind as we talk about this today, okay? Same thing with putting things in perspective. Gifted students. We know what an F means, right? That means bad, bad things, right? Okay, here's what I'm gonna tell you. We can earn a total of 120 possible points, right? We just talked about that. Do you know how many points we earned in our gifted category? 116. Do the math. That's 97%. When your gifted kids are already scoring at the highest level, how do they grow? Based on the same type of tests. We've got some kids and have had some kids over the course of the last three, four years that have gotten almost perfect scores. Well, if you've got an almost perfect score, how can you do better next time? Okay? It's a flaw in the system. Okay? But if you just look at this and you don't know that, Okay. Did we drop a little bit? We did. We were at 117 points last year. This past report card, we were at 116. So we did drop a little bit. But do the math. It's almost 97%, 96.7%, I believe, if you 
do the math 160 out of 120 possible points. Okay, so just to put it in context, this, oh, I guess I'll get that right. This student's in the lowest 20% of achievement. That's not lowest 20% here. The state takes all tests in the state of Ohio. They rank them, they break them into five quartiles. That bottom quartile would be the lowest 20%, right? Five times 20 is 100, 100 percent So this is any of our kids that fit into that bottom 20% within the state. Those are our at-risk kids. Those are our kids that maybe don't have the best things going on at home, or they have some issues in regards to their fun fundamental skills or their foundational skills, okay? We received an A in that category. Super proud of that, and I'm gonna show you when we compare to some of the other districts here in a few minutes, why we're so proud of that, okay? Taking our kids that are struggling and really putting the time in to get them to where they need to be. Okay? That's not the easiest thing in the world to do, uh, and it's something that our teachers really are taking a lot of pride in. And then our students with disabilities. Um, you see that we went up in that court category to D last year, to C this year. So our students that have diagnosed um, disabilities, and we again put the amount of time and resources in with those kids to try and get them the equity they need so that they can be as successful as their peers. Okay? Those of you who don't like numbers, here's more colors for you. So over on the right, here's what you'll see. Oh, uh, that button. So the darker the green is, the better it is. So what you see this yellow here, that yellow means that you've met a year's worth of growth. The state sets a certain benchmark or indicator that says this is how much you should grow within that year. If you're yellow, it means you've met that indicator. Okay, you met that benchmark, you met the amount of growth you should for the course of one year. <coughs> Where you see the different colored greens, this green and this green, okay, you'll see that this means that we've met a little bit better than one year's growth, and this means that there's a lot of evidence that we've met more than one year's growth. Okay, so a lot of yellow and green up there, good thing. When you look at this, and you see this right here, okay, those of you that are sitting there thinking, I don't want my kid to go to fifth grade, and we need to fire our fifth grade teachers. Okay. I want you to understand, this is a trend across the state of Ohio. Okay. This is a very, very difficult transition for kids. This is a period of time where standards change, okay. where expectations become higher, and it's a big transition where we go from learning to read to reading to learn. Does that, that make sense? Okay. We spend a lot of time in elementary school learning how to read. When we get to fifth grade, now you need to be able to use those skills effectively to comprehend what it is that you're reading and use that for your learning in other categories. Fifth grade's a tough year and it's a state trend, so it's not just here, it's not our fifth grade teachers, and, and I apologize to them for even having to put this up there, but reality is, if you look across the state, you're going to see the same thing, okay? Gap closing. When we take a look at this, this basically just means that the state takes the <clears throat> average scores across the state of Ohio, they take a look at your different subgroups, okay? and they take a look at what the gap is between those subgroups. So our all population, so they take our overall scores, that's one subgroup. Okay? Our white student population, our socioeconomic group, our students with disabilities, those are different subgroups. And they take a look at the goals or targets that are set up, and what does that gap look like? What this A says is we're doing an equitable job for all of our kids. That we're providing entry points and access for every kid, no matter what their level is within the classroom. We've closed that gap, okay? 94.2% are the scores that we've earned, looking at what are called AMOs or annual measurable objectives. I'm not going to get into the math on that tonight. That's a two hour conversation in and of itself. Okay. Know that this 94.2% A means we're doing a really good job. Okay. Um, here's some graphic. If you take over to the right here, this is language arts. The red dot is the goal. Okay. The line is where we got to. So you'll notice that the red dot has been surpassed in every one of those subgroups. So the green line up there represents our, our white subgroup. The purple line up there represents our all subgroups, so all students see that. The yellow represents our socioeconomic students, so students that are on free and reduced lunch, basically. Um, socioeconomic status is a big thing that we look at in the state of Ohio. And the light blue up there is our students with disabilities. Okay. This again, same thing, just showing you the other categories. So the left graph up there is math, 
again, you can see the red lines are, I'm sorry, the red dots are the goals. You'll see that in our white subgroup and in our all subgroup, we just barely missed our target goal, okay? Where we surpassed it everywhere else. Over on the right is graduation rate by subgroup. You'll notice there is no student with disability line over here. There's only three. You have to have 20 kids to make a subgroup. <coughs> and we didn't have 20 students on IEPs, 20 students with disabilities that graduated. So there is no subgroup in that category. That's why there's only three. Okay. All right, graduation rate. This, this one's a little near and dear to my heart as a high school teacher and former high school principal. When I got here five years ago, our graduation rate was 83.7 and 84%, okay? which was just below the state average of 86. In five years, we've seen our graduation rate raised by 10%. Super proud of that. Okay? What's our ultimate goal as a school district, right? To graduate kids that are career and college ready, kids that are ready to be successful. We've got 10% more of our kids leaving here with that piece of paper. It's the first step. Just earning that piece of paper doesn't mean that you're college and career ready. I'm not saying that, but it makes it a lot easier to get out and get on to the next step if you got that piece of paper. And with 10% more of our kids now that are graduating than we had five years Okay? So those numbers just tell us where we are in regards to our, co our cohort groups. So our four-year graduation rate, makes sense, right? Kids graduate in four years, 93.5%. Here's the other thing I want you to remember. Our graduating classes, with the exception of one since I've been here, are all less than 100 kids, right? So you're only looking at when we talk 93.5%, you're talking about four or five kids. Okay? And that's not the kids that started senior year. Those are the kids that started with that cohort group as freshmen. Okay? That's where they start that cohort group. So if they came in here as freshmen and they stay here. Now if a kid moves to Michigan, they come out of that group and they go to whatever school they go to. But of those kids that started here that end year, 93.5%, so all but four or five of them are getting out the door. Okay. And that's why we look at the five-year graduation rate. Okay. This was all but non-existent when I got here. When we talk about kids that after four years, what do we do? Oh, I didn't graduate, I'm dropping out. We've got kids now that are staying for that fifth year, coming during the summer, taking those opportunities to try and graduate. Um, and I know of Mr. Rook, we have three, four kids last summer that got diplomas after graduation? Yes. So, so again, those things weren't happening. We're getting kids those additional opportunities now. Okay? Here's again the trend that I just talked about. So this is 2000. Oh, oh, oh I gotta get it clear. Because I keep hitting the right button. This is 2014. This is 2018. Again, if you don't like numbers, they're scraps. Okay? You can see the increasing trend has continued to move on a yearly basis. Okay? All right, improving address K3 readers. Okay? This is a travesty in my opinion, but we start testing kids. In kindergarten, we actually start testing the preschool. But in kindergarten, we start testing kids. It's one of the first things we do, right? We bring kids in and we give them the KRA test before they even get into their classrooms. We stagger starts at the beginning of kindergarten and we test kids. Uh, a lot of fun, right? Okay. We use those tests, those assessments, kindergarten year, to determine whether or not a student is on track. Okay? Whether a student is prepared and has the skills they need. And we continue to test and monitor those things all the way through third grade, taking us to our wonderful third grade guarantee, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. So here's where we end up. Okay, so we have 58 students that started off track. 37 of those students moved to on track, and okay? that's where that 63.8% or that B. Okay, that's taking a look at that entire cohort group as they move through, not just the third grade kids. This is important. If you look at last year's report card, we had a number five there. What the heck does that mean? Five hundred reductions. When kids aren't on track, we put them on plans, right? We have to create a plan for every kid who's not on track that we believe needs additional intervention or assistance. We then work those plans, which is what helps us get those kids on track. This zero means that we didn't have any kids in that third grade that scored not on track that we weren't aware of and we didn't have a plan for. Okay? That's, that's important when you start to look at the data because they start to reduce and subtract stuff from you when those things happen. 98.6% okay? of our third graders have the third grade reading guarantee requirement for promotion to fourth grade. Okay? That 1.6, that's one kid. And that kid didn't end up moving to fourth grade. Um, 
with some reading interventions in place. So he did not repeat third grade. He did move on to fourth grade with some with a plan in place. If you will. Okay. Many third grade or how many third grade readers scored proficient? Eighty-one point one percent. That's one of the indicators we've met. The benchmark is eighty. Okay, so we were over the state benchmark for that at eighty percent. All right, prepared for success. This one's a joke. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Ninety to ninety-five percent of schools in the state of Ohio are in theater announcement and prepared for success. Okay? It's, it's, there's great theory behind prepared for success. It's supposed to measure how ready your kids are for college or careers. The problem is what they're trying to measure, schools aren't set up for yet. We're not there. We're moving in that direction, but we're not there yet. If you look at the 11 categories over here on the right, you'll notice that six of those 11 categories, we earn zero points in. Well, they don't take those out when they do the calculation. We get zero points from those. Okay? We don't even offer those programs here within our district. How are we supposed to get points in the academy? Okay? And it's true of many other school districts in the state of Ohio. That's why many, many people get these in that. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, we did get that. Mr. Rook and I have a little bit of a bet going on. Um, this data is from two school years prior. That's the only way that they can gauge the things they're trying to measure. So we kind of know what the data is going to look like because it's based on two years ago. Um, I'm not so convinced we aren't going to still have an F. Mr. Rook thinks we're going to be beyond that, so we got a little personal bet that I will share with you. Um, but we got a little bet going on as to whether or not that's still going to be an F next year. All right, so let's again put it in context. So here's a longitudinal look at our day. Okay? Those of you who like letters and numbers, great, they're out there. Those of you who don't, take a look at the colors. Okay, what did we say earlier? Reds, oranges, not good. Yellows, those are C's, those are average. Greens and blues, good colors. Over here to the left, over here to the left, you'll see a lot more of the reds, oranges, and yellows. Over here, you see a lot more of the greens and blues. Okay? I can't simplify it any more than that. You can see the growth that is going on. So, top. Top line up here, okay? We've only been getting an overall break for the past two years. They didn't give those before on the state report for it's one of the changes that's taking place. So these top three here are your achievement, so achievement performance indicator, and indicators met, okay? You'll see that we spent some time here in D's and F's, okay? And that F is still in place for indicators met, and I don't anticipate that changing anytime soon, okay? Our progress components, our value-added stuff that we talked about, okay, again, A's and B's, four-year, five-year graduation rate, pay three readers, prepared for success. Okay, again, you can see the growth that's taking place in the school district. Let me put it in some more context for you. These are all the school districts in Columbia County. Based on those factors that we just talked about, you can see how we compare, right? So we are at the top for no other reason that it's easier to reference everything else when, when you put yourself at the top. So again, take a look at this. Uh, or don't, like you did the wrong button. Take a look at the overall grade. You'll see that every school here but two received a C or a D in their overall grade. Okay? Notice that achievement component, everybody sees and D's. Performance index, everybody sees and D's. Indicators met, everybody's D's and F's. Okay? Again, there are some socioeconomic differences between some of the school districts here in Columbiana County, and it's my opinion, and many others around the state, that those are why you see the differences, and one of the only reasons why you see the differences up here. Over here, prepared for success. Okay, all these and like I said, 95, 90, 95% of the state. Um, here's that one I mentioned earlier, lowest 20% value added, only A in the county, okay? Really proud of the fact that the time and resources and energy we put in our lowest 20% uh, of students. Right? Here's another, again, context piece for you, and this talks to the socioeconomic stuff even more so than the last one. So these school districts up here may, may look very random. The state every year establishes a group of what they call similar school districts, 20 similar school districts. Right? Those school districts are similar based on five categories. Those categories are based on population, median income, uh, minority population, okay? those types of, of categories put these 20 schools with us. 
okay? Based again, primarily on population and social economic status. Again, take a look at this. Now that you've got school districts lumped together based on socioeconomic status, look how similar the grades are. They're almost the same all the way down almost every one of those categories. Okay? This screams loudly that socioeconomic status plays a major role in how you're going to perform on the state report. Okay? Before I move any further, questions on the report card? I thought that was going to be my best to try and get through that. Good with that. Alright. So let's talk about the state for a minute. So five years ago, three new administrators joined the district. We were in academic watch. Was it because this all of a sudden was a terrible school district? We were effectively a graded school district three to four years prior to that. Here's what happened, I'm not blaming anyone. The system in the state of Ohio was changing. As a district, we weren't doing a real good job of keeping up. Right? When we got here, we didn't go hire a bunch of better teachers and put a bunch of curriculum in place. And put, we recognized that the system was not in place in order for us to be successful based on the requirements and expectations of the state. So we came in and put the proper system in place to allow our students and our teachers to be successful. Right? That's basically what's happened over the course of the last five years in a nutshell. Um, that's very simplified, but that's basically what's happened. Okay? So we were put into what's called the Ohio Improvement Process. We were mandated um, due to where we were ranked as a district. And it required that there were a number of different things that we did. Big Brother was watching. Okay? There were reports we turned in every month. There were people monitoring and looking at the things that we were doing. Okay? Testing, I already talked about this. This is all the different things that have taken place in regards to testing changes over the course of the last five years. How in the world are you supposed to keep up with this and prepare for this when it changes everything? Okay? Reality is what it is and we do what we do. Okay? They revised all of our content standards. First math and language arts three to four years ago, science and social studies now, and we have a number of health and other elective um, categories that are going through revisions as we speak. They've also added, and we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, um, social emotional learning standards in the state of Ohio. Uh, they're just a suggestion right this minute. I expect within the next two years that they'll be coming out. 22 other states uh, in the country have already made them law, and I expect that we will follow suit. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. Okay? Graduation requirements is another joke. Okay, I've been here for five years. Graduation requirements have changed four times. We have four classes, right? Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. In our high school right now, we have three different sets of graduation requirements, depending on what grade level. How the world do you prepare a kid to graduate when you don't even know what the graduation standards are going to be? Literally two years ago, my last year as the high school principal, it was November until we knew what the graduation requirements were. For the kids that were graduating, man, I don't know how you hit this moving target. So the fact that we've raised our graduation rate by 10% in the midst of all that, super proud of that. Okay? Super proud of that. But we do currently have three different sets. Um, you know, Mr. Brooks does a great job at the high school trying to keep track of that. We've also brought a career counselor in to try and help with that. Uh, Mr. Cyrus does a great job in the guidance council, count, guidance counselor's office. It's a full-time job just to worry about graduation, not to mention all the other things we have going on. All right? State report card has changed. State report card will continue to change. Last Monday when I was sitting with the state superintendent, um, he was telling us about the different committees that are already convening to make changes within the state report card for next year. So stay tuned. We'll see next year what it looks like right now. We, we don't know, I just know there's changes coming. PBIS and SEL, if you have anything to do with education, you know we love our life. Right? We, we are acronym to death. Um, we call it our alphabet soup. So PBIS went into, into legislation. Okay? That's positive behavior intervention systems. Okay? It's the idea of making a paradigm shift in how we handle discipline with kids from that reactive piece to that proactive piece. To put systems in place to honor and recognize the good things we do versus focusing on the other things, okay? I'll never forget, and I came from a district that was kind of ahead on this. I'll never forget sitting down with my BLT and trying to institute PBI, a PBIS system of, of rewards and ways to recognize kids. And I'll never forget my, my BLT saying, 
Chris, there's no way high school kids are going to do this. You're crazy. Let's give it a shot. And I'm going to pick on Mr. Cyrus as he's sitting here. I'll never forget about three, about three months after we started it. He said, I would have never believed it, but the kids are responding to this stuff. They really are responding to this stuff. Um, so, so it does. It does work. Uh, we're out ahead of it. We've received awards. Um, our elementary school is, is an award winner in the state of Ohio for our work with PBIS. Um, our high school, I full, fully believe we'll, we'll receive an award this year um, in regards to the work that we're doing. SEL, you've probably seen this. It's in the news a lot. It's the new catch thing, social emotional learning. Okay, These are the things that parents used to take care of. Okay? It's not a dig on any parents right now. I forgive my own, but this is the conversation. Kids aren't being taught how to deal with the things that they have to deal with, and they're coming to school lacking the skills that they used to have. And it's now become the responsibility of schools to help to get them prepared with the proper social emotional skills to handle adversity. Okay? Here's my own opinion on it, take it for what it's worth. Here's the problem. Kids have access now to whatever they want. That's a general statement, and I'm sure that many of you as parents have limits on your kids' social media and yada, yada, yada. But kids have access to just about anything they want. They have access to the same stuff that you and I have access to. I don't know about you, but I'm fairly certain, and my wife may argue with you about this, that most 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds do not have the maturity or the skill level to handle the stuff that they have access to, like I do. And that's where my wife may argue. Right? <laughs> Reality of the situation is that we have to recognize that. Should schools be the place where we teach it? <laughs> we can talk about that all day. Reality is I expect this to be legislation within the course of the next year to two years. The standards are already in place, but right now they're just a suggestion. Right? Change in attendance laws. Um, those changes in attendance laws put some good structure in place, but really kind of took the teeth out of any consequences that we had for kids and parents, made it a little bit more difficult. Now we just get to have a lot of meetings. <coughs> you know, people that are not going to school. They already know it because they're not going to school. Reality is what it is. We're trying to do things better in that regard. Our chronic absenteeism rate was 19% last year. That's too high. That's too high. Um, I'll talk to you about some of the things that we're trying to put in place to help with that. Um, no Child Left Behind, which is the federal legislation, was changed. It was time for that law to, to either be repealed or to be updated. It was updated two years ago to every student succeeds that. That was changes in federal legislation. Anytime legislation changed, it has an impact on us. So we have made the adjustments accordingly based on what the law says. Okay. Evaluation systems have changed. Um, next year we will go to OTES 2.0 and OPEZ 2.0. So we've been under this current evaluation system for a while. There are a number of schools in the state of Ohio right now that are piloting the new program, and we will all fall under this new evaluation system next year, which again, now, new benchmarks, new expectations and standards for teachers to be evaluated on. So again, something else we're gonna have to do uh, Safety plans, we now have to certify our safety plans as a school district, certainly is a comment on the society that we're living in today, right? Um, every school district has to have a, a security plan that's been certified and approved by the Department of Homeland Security. You have to update those every three years. Um, our certainly is in place. This year we are actually due to recertify, so we are actually in the process of that now. Um, and we'll be finishing that up in January. We're the All right, so all of that stuff going on in the state, what have we done? So how have we adjusted to those things? Remember, this is over the course of the last five years. <coughs> so we changed start times for all three buildings. Why did we do that? Well, we had to provide some time, okay? With all the things we just talked about, we're certainly asking a lot more of teachers, right? Okay? We had to provide some time for some of these things to take place, for the plans to be put in place, for all the changes to be worked on for, for the intervention plan, for all the different things that we talked about. So we provided time for call the morning time for staff, provided provide opportunity for creation of effective TBT, BLT, DLT, more of our alphabet soup, right? TBT is teacher-based teams. Weekly our teachers meet in either content or grade levels to talk about strategies going on in the classroom, professional development, um, interventions for kids, whatever the case may be. 
VLT is our building leadership team. They meet monthly to talk about the reports from the TBTs and the resources and things they need to help deal with the issues we're having in buildings. The information from both of those roll up to our district leadership team, which also meets monthly, to again, take a look at what's going on at the teacher level, the building level, and to try and provide strategies and resources. We've included in our DLT some of our other stakeholders. Okay? We have a few parents that are part of that. We have a few board members. We obviously have a number of, of teachers that are on that. Um, so we're getting some of that community input as to what's going on. And we'll continue to advance that as we become more effective. Uh, where are we? Course realignment, curriculum mapping, I just told you standards have changed almost all of them over the course of the last four years. So we've had to go back and take a look at all of our courses. Teachers have remapped all of their courses, aligned the curriculum to make sure that there are no gaps, that we're teaching the kids what we need to teach them in regards to the state standards. All right. Uh, curriculum, we've also increased our, our CCP offerings. That's the, the dual credit where kids can be here in high school or actually go to the university, provided they qualify for the program. Uh, and they can receive dual credit. So they can take a class in calculus, for example, receive college credit, and receive high school credit both, and it's paid for by the school district. So kids can leave, both of my kids graduated from high school as, well, one sophomore and one, and almost a junior in college when they left school. Saved that a lot of money. Okay. We've also added intervention time and support classes, online courses, credit recovery, ACT, we have a lot of different things to help support the needs of our kids. We have a PK-12, so preschool all the way up to 12th grade focus for both our academics and our social emotional learning. When we talk about aligning those standards, we're not just aligning within the building, we're aligning across the district. Right. We did purchase a new K ELA curriculum uh, because we again saw some gaps in the one that we were using. We put a big focus on transition, especially for the secondary pathways. I can't tell you the number of kids, and this isn't just here, okay, but I can't tell you the number of kids that as the high school principal I would have sit across from me at 17, 18 years old getting ready to graduate and had no clue. Had absolutely no clue what their plan was. I think the assumption was that there was magic fairy dust on that piece of paper I handed when they walked across the state, and they were going to wake up the next morning with an idea as to what they were going to do with the rest of their lives. Right? That is not the type of kid that we want to graduate from our schools. So we've made a very concerted effort starting three years ago to start this down in the middle schools. Okay? We do what we call our 3E event. You know, I wasn't a big Governor Kasich fan, but one of the things that he did promote that I really appreciated were his 3Es, and, and we stole it. We didn't make this up, I stole it. Okay? But it's getting kids to understand that they have to be ready to follow one of those 3E pathways. They either have to be ready to enroll in a post-secondary institution, have employability skills to go out and get a job, or to be ready to enlist in the military. One of those three. So we've been starting to provide students in seventh and eighth grade information. We've got people coming in to talk to them. Uh, we're doing different types of presentations. We've got different assemblies that go on. We do different lessons with the kids throughout the course of the year. And at the end of their eighth grade year, we actually have a ceremony with our eighth graders, where they walk across this very stage and they commit to which one of those three E's they're going to explore in high school. It's not set in stone, it's not in concrete, but we travel and it helps us to get the kids into the proper programs and the places they need based on their interests. Okay? A lot of that type of stuff is changing in high school, very different than what it used to look like. Okay? We've created transition classes for our freshmen. Every one of our ninth graders, with a few outliers and exceptions, every one of our ninth graders takes a transition class to try and help with that transition to understanding what high school is about, what the workload looks like, and the fact that they have to be prepared by the time they're senior. Every one of our freshmen takes that. By the time they get up to senior year, we hopefully have had kids that now have made some decisions. And we're starting to put some curriculum in place that says to a kid, hey, if you're going to college, this is the type of course that you want to take. We get a lot of those in place. But what about those other kids? What about those other kids that have said, you know what, I'm not going to college. Cool, you don't have to go to college. Okay? Kids really look at you crazy when you're a high school principal and you tell them they don't have to go to college. They look at you real crazy because isn't that what school's all about and send you to the next school, right? Okay, no, it's about getting you prepared for whatever it means. Okay? You don't have to go to college to be successful. Okay? 
okay? And it's something that we have to start touting more and more as an educational system. So we put classes in place like our career English language arts. Those kids aren't studying the stuff that the college kids are studying. Are we still within the standards? Absolutely. But it makes more, a lot more sense for those kids to be reading technical manuals and understanding what their reading and writing is going to look like in their future. Okay? We've got them doing mock interviews. We've got them going out to visit different industries. We've got different industries coming in and talking to them. Okay? It's an opportunity for our kids to see that there are other successful pathways beyond college. That's changed a whole lot of course for the last three to five years. And it's actually one of the reasons why we got invited uh, to sit on the advisory council because of the work that we were doing and the administrative team talked about when we went to our, our administrative conference in June. Um, addition of the second preschool, you know, that helped us all those triple the number of students getting early interventions. We all know the importance of building a solid foundation. Right? We want to help with that as much as we can. Middle school and high school, you know, this is near and dear to my heart. I ran a robotics program for a long time prior to coming here. It's the direction of the future. Not the future, it's here now. And that's reality. But it's just going to continue to drive the things that are going on. We now have both a middle school and a high school robotics curriculum. Uh, we've actually got a robotics team that's not only going to participate at a local event um, that they participated in last year, but we were actually, uh, we actually had one of the, the major robotics competition groups in, this, in the world versus an international robotics. They came to us and said, hey, we're trying to get down here in Columbia County. We're trying to get more presence, and we think your school would be a great place for us to put on a competition. Absolutely, come on down. Absolutely, come on down. We didn't have to pay to get our own team in. Our kids are getting additional curriculum, additional experiences, and there's going to be anywhere from 24 to 50 schools coming here on January 11th to 12th to compete with the robots that they're building based on the curriculum that's going on in schools. So put that on your calendar. Come and see the amazing things that these kids are doing. Okay? It's a phenomenal program, and we're going to host it right here. Okay? Right here in our own gym, January 11th. All right, here comes the not fun stuff. Okay, that's all the stuff that's gone on in the state. Okay, many of those things are what we call unfunded mandates. Okay, which means that the state says you got to do it, but we aren't giving you any money for it. Right? So let's talk about that. Any of you that pay attention to what goes on at the board meetings, or if you were with us May second last year, um, I did another one of these presentations to talk just about finances, not about anything else but finances. This was our five-year forecast last October. Okay? We're not going to stand here and look at all these numbers. And, and I want you to look at the bottom row. Okay? That bottom row in red. If those of you who do your budgets at home know that black is good, red's bad, right? <laughs> so if you take a look at last year, first column is 18, 19. We were predicted at the end of last year, in October, to be $173,000 in the hole at the end of the school year. This year, second column, 2019-2020, we were projected to be almost $800,000 in the whole. Okay? Right. How in the world do you run a school district when you're $800,000 in the whole? Right. So I didn't quite realize, I still would have taken the job, but I didn't quite realize in August that we were quite at this point. Shame on me, I should have paid more attention to this high school principal. Right? So this was the first thing, probably the biggest thing that I dealt with and consumed me all last year. Okay. I will tell you that our forecast doesn't quite look like this right now, and there's a couple different reasons, and I want to talk to you about those reasons. Okay. So, if you remember last year, at that meeting in May, I said, based on those numbers, right, almost $800,000 projected in the hole this year, five years out, we're projected to be over $4 million in the hole. So, what are our options? Okay. What are we going to deal with? And this is a slide directly from that presentation on May 7th. We can either reduce expenditures, Right? The amount of money we're putting out. How do we do that? We cut staff, we cut programming, and reduce services. It's the only way to save money. You don't spend it on things that you have to spend it on, right? You can get additional revenue. That's great if you're a company. You put strategies in place to try and raise more money based on selling more or different products. We don't sell products. <coughs> I get money from three places. The federal government, who's stingy and isn't giving us any more money. The state who's flat funded us again for the next two years. We've been flat funded for the majority of the last 10 years, meaning that as inflation goes up, they haven't given us any more money. And guess what? Local taxes. Okay, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about where we are currently with local taxes. 
So we reduce expenditures, we pick up additional revenue, or a combination of the two, which actually probably makes the most sense, right? So I presented these two plans last May. Plan A was to eliminate two bus routes and their associated resources. Sell three of our order buses and deal with the insurance and the things that go with those. Absorb five staff positions. Those are teaching positions. We had four people retire and one person resigned because they moved out of state. Renegotiate our collective bargaining agreement. Renegotiate service contracts that we have with many businesses that come in and provide things for us. And put a letter on the ballot in November 2019. Okay? We had three different options at that point. I'll we'll talk more about that in a second. Plan B was everything in plan A. If we don't have a letter, here's the additional things we have to do. Reduce an additional five to, six, five to six staff members. Go to state minimum busing, which means we only bus people that are outside of a two mile radius from the school campus. And eliminate the general fund support of extracurriculars, which means we would go to pay to participate. And I know we currently have a $20 fee to participate. It's going to be a whole lot more than that. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute also. All right, so what did we do? I presented those plans in May. This isn't like General Motors. We don't take time off and retool, and guess what? School's over in May, school starts back up in August. Okay? Budget was passed in July. We were flat funded, got no additional money. Something's gotta give, right? We're going into a school year where we're projected to be $800,000 in the hole. Okay? I can't make, I can't pay my bills by December. Okay? So, we did absorb those five teaching positions, okay, to the, to the tune of about $450,000. Um, in savings. What's that mean? Well, the good thing, and this is the only time I'll say this is a good thing, our population has reduced by about 80 students, about 20 students a year over the course of the last four to five years. So we did have fewer students we were able to absorb, and it doesn't mean that there still aren't larger class sizes, fewer resources. It certainly creates that problem. Okay? We did cut two bus routes. Okay? Now my plan was really only to cut one last year. I cut a second one because I couldn't find a bus driver. <laughs> they don't exist. If any of you know where, what tree they grow on, please let me know. Um, because they're pretty valuable, you can't find them. This summer I did find an additional bus driver, so we put one route back in. We also purchased a van last year to more efficiently deal with. We were sending buses to places with three and four kids on them. Um, just not a good use of our resources and our money. So we did purchase a van last year. Those two things are in place. We made our transportation much more efficient than it was. We did sell three old buses. Guess what, guys? Old buses aren't worth much. Worth a whole lot less than I thought they were going to be worth. Uh, we did postpone the purchase of two new buses the last two years. Uh, we were on the cycle of buying a bus a year. We stopped that. We are going to get back on that if you're at the board meeting on Monday. You know, we just put a resolution through to start looking at purchasing another bus here coming up in the next year or two. We renegotiated service con contracts for cost savings. For example, I pulled in the, the, our printer company that we deal with, our copier company. I pitted them against another company, okay? See who was going to be able to do the best work for it. <clears throat> Saved about $40,000 and got new copiers in, in, in the mix, okay? We did those types of things. We looked at all the companies we were dealing with and how we could go about saving some, some money, okay? We reduced our deficit spending. Everybody knows what that means, right? Deficit spending is when you spend more than half. Okay, we've been doing a whole lot of that over the course of the last five to ten years. Last year was the first year in a while that we did not deficit spend. We actually spent less than we had coming in. It was the first time in a while it was because we paid attention to every single penny that we had coming in and going out. Okay? It's not a lot of fun when principals and teachers come to you and want things and you have to tell them no. Because at the end, who suffers? It's the kids. Right? But reality is what it is. We've got to pay the bills. We also utilized the process of working with the Fiscal Commission and Performance Audit Team. Those of you that were there last year know that we had both of those entities, entities in here fully ready to take over the district from a financial standpoint. Okay? We did enough good work last year that the Fiscal Commission said, we'll see you next year. The Performance Audit Team gave us their report and they left too. Thank goodness. Okay? They were impressed with the, the plan and the things we put in place enough that they left us alone which is great, because once they come in and take over, they can be here for 20 years, okay? They're here until you can clear a five-year forecast, okay? 
right, which is not an easy thing to do, and there are not many school districts in the state of Ohio that can do that. All right, here's the other thing that happened. House Bill 166, which is the budget bill that was passed July 18. The new governor put in something that's very near and dear to his heart. It's called the Wellness and Success Fund. And I immediately had a phone call from people saying, well, you're not going to go on the ballot now, are you? You're getting all kinds of money. You don't need to go on the ballot. Well, let me explain. Okay, let me explain. Is there strings attached to this money? definition, wait, it, it gets more specific in a few minutes. Okay? We don't have a deadline to spend it, which is great. It's typically when we get money. Like when we get federal money, it's got to be spent and accounted for at the end of each school year. There's no deadline to this. They've actually encouraged us to keep this money and put together a solid five-year plan to use it. Great. Great. But there's still only certain things we can use it. We have to create a plan. We have to sit with the community partner. We can't create the plan by ourselves. I'll tell you who those are in just a second. We can do what's called supplanting. Supplanting means where you go ahead and you pay for something you're already doing. So it means that we can take some of that money. So here's a good example. We decided two, maybe three years ago, we were paying a fair amount of money to have a school psychologist here in our district two days a week. When we really crunched the numbers and did the math, we realized that we could pay our own school psychologist a salary cheaper and have them here for five days a week and only be responsible for our district and nobody else. So we went ahead and did it, and it was best for our district. Well, because of the way these definitions are written, I can now take some of this money, I can pay for that person, and put that money that I was paying that person back into the general fund to use for other things. That's what supplanting means. Okay? It's not encouraged. They don't want us doing that, but they haven't forbid us from doing that. So a district like us that's in trouble, you better believe I'm doing that. Okay, I've done it to the tune of probably about two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars at this point, which is not what I would want to do with that money because there's all kinds of innovative things I'd love to be doing, but right now we got to pay the bills, right? So we are doing some of this plan. Here's what we're getting: fiscal year 2020. That's now three hundred sixty-seven thousand nine hundred four dollars. We'll get this in two installments. First one in October. Second one is in March. Yeah. Rick, March. Okay, so we'll get it in two installments. Next year, fiscal year 2021, $536,756 for a total two year, two year total, sorry, of $904,000. All right? Does that help? You better believe it. The problem is it's targeted money. Here's what I can spend it on. Right? The left hand side are the categories that we can spend it on mental health services, services for homeless youth, services for child welfare involved youth, community liaisons. Physical health care services, mentoring programs, family engagement support services, city connects programming, professional development regarding provisions of trauma informed care, professional development regarding cultural competence, student services provided prior to or after the regularly scheduled school day or any time school is not in session. So, how much of that seems to fit in with what your typical vision of what we do in schools is? Not very well, right? Okay? There's a lot of stuff that's being forced on schools now. That's not what traditional schools looked like 10, 15, 20 years ago. Okay? This is a lot of mental health stuff. Okay? I can't get teachers out of this. Okay? I can't buy curriculum supplies out of this. Okay? I can't supplant. I'm doing some of that. But that can't be the only thing we do because I have to write a plan and I have to be accountable to the state. And if that's the only thing we do, I'm going to get slapped on the wrist. Okay? It's not going to hurt too bad and I've been slapped before. It's okay. But there's other things we can be doing, and our kids need some of these other things. Over to the right are the community partners that we have to sit at the table with when we write a plan. Board of Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health, Educational Service Center, County Board of Developmental Disabilities, Community Based Mental Health Treatment, Board of Health, County Department, nonprofit organizations with experience serving children, that was pretty big, and public hospital agencies. So let me tell you some of the things we've done. I already told you that we're supplanting and we're paying our school psychologists. Okay, we also brought in as a community liaison, we hired our own student resource officer. In the past, we've been sharing two to three officers for five hours a day with the city when we could get here. We now have our own seven hour a day student resource officer that's dedicated just to the district. Phenomenal. Bill's doing a great job. The kids love them, teachers love them. And who doesn't want to have, in the day and age that we live in, 
who doesn't want to have a dedicated resource officer in your district doing a phenomenal job. Um, we also increased, we contracted with Akron Children's Hospital for our nursing. Um, that was limited to a certain number of hours because of the money we had. We've now increased those hours. We actually have coverage all day at all three of our buildings, which we didn't have. Okay? We're also dealing with some of our other at-risk students and spending that money in some other innovative ways. Like I said, to the tune right now of about two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, trying not to spend it all because I want to be able to do some of the other things that I'd like to see put in place. I've, I'm in talks right now with Akron Children's Hospital to look at putting a community health center here at the school. Okay, imagine the ability for us to be able to have health care right here within in the building, not only for our kids but for our families to be able to come here as a central location. Um, they're piloting in a few other places and. And I'm on board. That's one of the things that, that I want to use some of this money for. But I, we can say all night talk about that. So here's where we are now. If you were at the board meeting on Monday, you know that we passed our current five-year forecast projections. Now, the only thing I will tell you, be careful. The other one that you said had last year on it, this one doesn't have last year on it because last year's over. Okay, so don't try to look column to column. The second column on that one is the first column on this one. Okay, so be careful. But notice at the bottom here, we now have an ending fund balance for this year. We were projected last year at this time to be 800,000 in the hole. We're now projected to be 300,000 in the black. Why? I just explained it to you. All of those different things that we've done, okay, all of those different things that we've done, along with using the wellness and success money in the way that we have. Projected next year, 214,000, and then the bottom drops out. Why does the bottom drop out? Because we only have a two-year budget from the state of Ohio. Right now we're flat funded. I have no idea if that wellness and success money, and we can't continue to put it in there. Okay? Inflation continues to go up. We continue to deal with things like increased medical costs, okay? increased benefit costs, inflation, okay? and we continue to be flat funded by the state. Okay? Also, and I know you probably don't feel this way. I know I don't feel this way. I live in the board, but okay? taxes aren't going up a whole lot either. Okay, so our revenue is not increasing, but everything else is. Okay? So when people came to me right away and said, Chris, you're getting almost a million dollars, it means you don't have to go on the ballot. Yeah, we do, because look at what happens. We're going to be right in the same place next year where I'm trying to figure out what in the world to do again and how to run a school district. We've got to be proactive. We've got to put a plan in place. This is where I need your help. Right? So again, you can see those numbers. I'm not going to beat a dead horse. But you're looking at five years out, again, we're estimating if nothing changes to be about $4 million in the ground. Five years out. That's what we've got to have. All right. So here's where we are. I'm going to give you a lesson on school finances you probably don't want. Okay, but I'm going to give it to you anyways just so that you understand. Okay, one, our school finance system is unconstitutional. It was declared unconstitutional 30 years ago. Okay? Our system is based on your ability as taxpayers to support the school. I'm going to show you what that means here in just a second. So the state sets a per pupil cost of doing business. The state says that we will give you, okay, or you should have, $6,020 for every butt you have received. Okay? For every kid that is enrolled in your district, you should have $6,020. The state says, okay, now we're going to look at what your community's ability is to pay. They plug all this stuff into a formula that we're not going to get into. And the state says, for East Palestine School District, we are going to give you 64% of that $6,020. So they give us $3,865 for every kid that comes in. That means our local share then is $2,155 to make up that total of $6,000. Okay? We receive state federal money based on an annual membership. Remember I told you a little bit ago, we're flat funded. We're not giving us any more money. We've lost any kids. What's that mean? We've lost money, right? Those kids are gone, okay? On top of that, okay, it's a problem, it is what it is, we're trying to address it. Open enrollment, okay? We've lost $4.5 million in the last five years to open enrollment. Here's the beauty of this. When kids leave, they take $6,020 with them. They don't take the state share, they take it all. So your local tax dollars are going to other school districts anytime a kid open enrolls from here, okay? Local tax dollars to the tune of $1.6 billion we lost. I'm happy to tell you, I guess I'm not happy, I guess I'm cautiously optimistic, that if you go back and look at our open enrollment numbers over the course of the last four years, 
Every year our net loss is about, a, about an additional 20 kids. Okay? We're losing about an additional 20 kids. I just ran the numbers yesterday. Kids coming in versus kids going out, our net loss is one. Okay? So we've kind of at least stopped the bleeding a little bit. Okay? We certainly haven't solved the problem. We still have 180 kids out to open enrollment. But it's much better than losing an additional 20 kids, which is what we've lost every year for the last three or four years. Okay? On top of the 80 that have left for other reasons. Okay? So right now, as of yesterday, our net loss is one, which is much better than it's been in the last five years. Okay? <coughs> All right, so here's the source of our funding. I just told you. Locally, we provide about 18%. State provides about 65%. Federal government and other title and grant funds make up the other 15 to 16%. Over on the right, you can see what the state averages are. So that you can see, our local is much lower than the state average. Okay, the state average is about 40% locally. We're paying less than 20% for the education of our kids here. Okay. Spending per pupil. Well, Chris, I thought you just said the cost of doing business is six thousand and twenty dollars. Well, that's what the state's formula says it should be. Okay. Our spending per pupil costs are about eight thousand two hundred and seventy dollars. The state average is nine thousand seven hundred dollars. So we are well below the state average in per pupil spending. I just spent a half an hour telling you about all the improvements and things that we've done here. And we're $1,500 below the state average for people spending. We're being very, very effective and efficient with the things that we're doing, how we spend our money, and what we're doing for our kids. Okay. Here's just another way to look at it. Remember those 20 similar districts I talked to you about earlier? Okay. Here it is graphically. That red dot up there is awesome. The blue dots are the other 20 school districts. The red line that's running across, that red line is the state average for performance index. That's that performance stuff we talked about with the report card. Notice we're above that state average line. The red line running down is the average state cost per pupil spending. Notice we're to the left of that. Okay? Notice actually there are only three schools in our similar districts that spend less money per pupil than we do. Okay? And you'll notice that only two are performing better than we do. Okay? Very efficient in the things that we're trying to do with money. East Palace is among the 20% of public districts with the lowest operating expenses per pupil. We're actually in the bottom 18%. Okay? Bottom 18% in the state in per pupil spending. And we sit in the top 60% of performance. Okay? So here's the place where I would love to do my best, Billy Mays impression for you and tell you that you're going to get, you know, if, if you order now, right? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm dating myself, guys. Remember who Billy Mays was? That's the infomercial guy, right? Here's where I'd love to tell you. You know, if you order now, not only are you going to get it, but I'm going to give you additional. Guys, I'd love to be able to tell you that. I can't. I can tell you that if you are willing to work with us, okay, if you are willing to work with us on November 5th, Here's what we're asking. Based on the feedback that I got from the community last year, we made the decision to put a half percent earned income tax issue on the ballot coming up November 5th. Here's what that means. Okay. Earned income excludes investment and retirement income. So those of you who have mom and dad, grandma and grandpa at home that are on fixed retirement, Incomes, and that's the only income they have, that's not going to be taxed. Okay? For some of you, that makes you feel good. For some of you, it probably doesn't make you feel good because that means that some people aren't paying you off. I get it. Reality of the situation is what it is. Okay? He uses the base, the same taxable income is reported for state income tax purposes. Okay? So whatever your state income tax says, your earned income for the year is, that's what you will be taxed on. Okay, so I just did a quick example. I picked a nice round number of $50,000. Okay, the median income in this school district is $34,000. Okay, $50,000. If you make fifty dollars a year, half percent income tax, so 0.005 times $50,000 is $250 a year. It's less than $10 every two weeks. Okay, $9.61 
Every two weeks, if you get paid every two weeks, you get paid once a month, do the math. It'd be $19.22. Okay? That's what I'm asking. That's what we're asking. Okay? We put a five year term on it. These can be continual. Okay? Help us for the next five years. Give me the opportunity to put together a plan to deal with some of the other things that we have in place to see if we can't get ourselves fiscally sound to where we don't have to go to the taxpayers again. I'm not making any promises because there's a lot of stuff that we don't control. But my hope is in five years, we can have this figured out. Okay? My hope is that the state funding formula is going to change. There's a lot of stuff on the table right now. There's actually something called the Cuff Patterson Initiative that is going to legislation this year that would change the way schools are funded and that could possibly help us with this. But I don't know that. Here's the other thing that I need you to understand. With this type of levy, if we were to pass this levy, it takes about 18 months for us to see the full valuation. Okay? So for us to see the full, about $626,000 is what this would generate annually within our district. Okay? That's another reason why we're doing this. It gives us a little bit of time for this to ease in for people. And we still have the ability over the course of the next 18 months to do business the way we need to do business. Okay? Election day is November 5th. That's all I can say about it. Okay? I can't push the levy. I can just give you information. I did give you when you walked in today. Okay? I tried to deal with it. I had many people ask me questions. Okay? One of which, and it's on the back, and, and when my wife read that one, she kind of laughed, where it talks about, you know, are all these cuts you talk about, are those just threats? Guys, I just showed you they're not threats. We actually instituted a lot of those cuts already because we had to. Will we institute the other ones? I will if I have to. Not because I want to, okay? but I will if we have to. Okay? Reality is, is what it is, guys. That's not a threat. Okay? I can only do what I can afford. Okay, reality is what it is, and that's kind of where we are, and that's what tonight is about, painting that picture for you. So please take a look at that handout when you get a chance if you have it on already. Here's the other thing I shared this last May, and I want to share again. Our local tax effort, okay, this is informational only, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad about what we do. This actually came from the performance audit last year. So East Palestine City School District, our local tax effort here, our primary peers were a group of school districts, mostly local, but the performance audit team chose to compare us to in a variety of other categories, and they used them here too. Our local tax effort is 28% less, I mean, we're paying 28% less taxes than these other school districts that are considered our primary peers. When we look at our local peers, which is basically our Columbiana County, with the addition of one or two other schools, Okay. Our tax effort here is 33.5% less. Okay. Guys, if you want us to have those things, I, I gotta have them. Okay. We've got to work on some way to increase our revenue in the state and federal government just already did. Alright. I'm sure I'm over my time to write one to be done in an hour. Um, guys, when we talk about this idea of what we did not support. We did not take this on a lane. Okay? If you take a look at, at that paper again, I gave you the recent history. Okay? Back in 1993, we, we passed the levy. I don't remember the village, it's on your paper. Okay? We went back to the voters again, I think in 98, and then again in 2010. Okay? We haven't seen, and I'm not saying the taxes haven't increased with property values and yada yada yada, but we have not put an additional piece on there that's an operating levy. I know it has a bond stuff. Okay. But operating levies since 1993. Okay. Imagine if I asked you to do a remodeling project at your house and said you can do it, but I'm not giving you any money for it. So you got to do it for nothing. That's what the state of Ohio is telling us. The state of Ohio says continue to do business and do all these new things that we keep changing on you, but we're going to flat fund you. We're not giving you any money. That's what's happening. Okay. That's what's happening. Our system is set up. I didn't set it up. I don't agree with it. Our system is set up for local tax dollars to support the schools. Okay? At, at this point, we're coming to you and saying, we need your help. To maintain the things that we're doing, 
okay, and to improve upon the things that we want for our kids, it takes resources. Okay? I'm not sure where else to get those resources from. That's why I don't know. Okay? One of the other things that we talk about is communication. One of the first things I heard last year is why I'm standing up here in front of you now, why I did it last year, why we did it in May, why I set up monthly meetings. People said, we, we don't communicate well. We, we're, nobody's giving, giving us information. If you haven't realized by now, this is the first time that you've ever sat and listened to me, I'll talk to you as long as you want. Okay? If you want to talk, I'm your dad. And I talk in my sleep, or at least that's what my wife tells me. Okay? <laughs> so, we established monthly key communicator meetings. This is something that Superintendent Hosteller was doing four or five years ago. I've continued those. It's an opportunity for us to provide a bridge between the community and the school district, okay, in order to improve some of the things and add some of the things that we're doing. There's been some great programs that have come out of that. I've been doing monthly coffee with the superintendent meetings, okay. I started them last year in November. Some, some nights I have 30 people. Other nights I sit here by myself. I don't drink coffee, so I drink water when I go home. Okay, reality is what it is. We will start those up again this year. Don't copy that date down because it's wrong. I just looked up there and realized my typing's not the greatest. That needs to be the 16th, not 15th. <laughs> so if you're writing that down, write down the 16th, please. Um, I do one in the morning at 9.15 in the morning, and then I do the same meeting at 6 o'clock. Those of you that are going, oh my God, I'm not going to listen to you talk for another hour again. Okay? That's not about me talking. I'm just here to answer questions. If you have questions, if you have problems, if you have issues, I'm here, you can have, I may have the answers, I may not, I'll get the answers for you. Okay? But it's about that communication and that transparency piece. We've updated the district website and the Facebook page. If you haven't been there, go check them out. Um, we also have a new district app. I'm going to plug this here real quick, it'll take just a minute. If you haven't been there, please go out and, and download this. Not my baseball cards, but my fantasy football stuff that's popping up over here. This is just a quick commercial, if you will, about the app. Introducing the brand new app for East Palestine City School District on Android and iPhone. It's everything EPCSD in your pocket. This is the home screen. Tap the school's icon in the top right or swipe left to select a specific school. Tap the three horizontal lines in the top left or swipe right to see all the menu items. To turn on push notifications, tap settings and select turn on notifications. You can even pick which school to receive notifications from. The events section shows a list of all events throughout the district. You can use this button to add an event to your calendar or tap here to share the event with friends and family. Live feed is where you'll find updates from administration about what's going on in the district right now. Whether that's celebrating a student's success or reminding you about an upcoming deadline. Search East Palestine City School District in the App Store or Play Store to explore the app for yourself. It's everything EPCSD in your pocket. So, last year, as we tried to improve communication, I found myself going to the website going to the Facebook page, making all the calls, sending things home with kids in their backpacks. It's got to be a way, better way to do this. So we found this company, they're the only ones out there, but they were the most reasonable. We found this company that puts everything in one place. I can now go type one thing in, hit five buttons, and it goes out to everywhere. Right? We, we just started it. Some people are better at it than others. Mr. Pavlovich, Mr. Rook are doing a great job. They're putting stuff on there multiple times a day. Okay? Um, we are having a few bugs, we're trying to work them out. But the goal is, here over the course of the next couple of months, that we get all these worked out, and here's your place for communication. You want to know anything. Um, sometimes it's kind of annoying, because I get notifications from every school and every other, so my phone is constantly beeping. But you can set your, your app up to, to notify you anytime something new has been put up there. Okay? You can stay in touch with everything that we've got going on here. Okay? Community engagement pieces. I'm trying to get out there and do as much as I can. In the next few weeks, I'm going to speak at Senior Fun Day. I'm speaking to the Chamber of Commerce the following week. Uh, we've got a Senior Citizens Dinner here. We've done for the last three or four years on October 29th. Um, we share that with anybody that you know. Get them here. It's a great event. It's a great opportunity for us. I don't know if any of you know this. I didn't know this until this morning. 
We are actually one of eight counties in the state of Ohio that is actually population flipped. You know what that means? We now have more senior citizen population than we do younger population. It happened in 2018 is when we, we well, flip, I guess. I didn't realize that there was a speaker that I went to actually this morning that was talking about it. Um, it's an important piece to know, and it's important that we recognize that and that we acknowledge that important cohort group here within our community. All right. So what are our future plans? Guys, I'm not going to make future plans yet. I know what I want to do, but without having the resources, there's no point in even attempting. Are we keeping up with what we have to? Absolutely. Are we looking forward? You better believe it. As a DLT, we've got a new three-year focus plan that set up our academic and climate goals. We work that plan every month. Strategic planning is one of the things I talked about last May. I said, we are going to build a strategic plan. We were supposed to start in August. And we heard loud and clear from the community, don't. Wait. Let's wait and see what happens. Can we get this levy passed? Because you can plan a lot differently if you know what your resources look like. Fair enough. All right? We're going to start this process in January because I'm optimistic. All right? We're going to start this process in January. We will have a five-year strategic plan to share with you by the end of the school year. All right? That includes all cohort groups. It includes both financial, permanent improvement, academic, climate goals, okay? community goals. Okay? Full scope five-year strategic plan. I know they've been done in the past. I don't have one. I can't find one. And most of the time when this stuff happens, it gets thrown in a drawer and nobody looks at it. And we don't do that with our focus plan, and I assure you we will not do it with the strategic plan either. All right. Guys, I would be more than happy. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Right. If you want to stay, I will be happy to answer your questions. If you want to go to that my email address, feel free to send me questions. Feel free to call my secretary and stop in. Right? My staff will tell you I have an open door policy. If I'm here and you want to stop in, stop in. I'll put my stuff away. I do paperwork at night. I don't sleep much at night. I do a lot of great work between 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock in the morning. Okay? I'll do paperwork later. I have an open door policy. Come and see me if you have questions. Share this with your friends. I don't know how to get more people here. Okay? Share this with your friends. If you want to have a meeting at your house, call me. Hey, Chris, I got a bunch of friends. Can you come over Thursday night? I'm there. Okay? Hopefully at dinner, but I'm there. <laughs> okay? You got an organization you're a part of that you think they need to hear some of this? Obviously, I can do a much smaller version of this. Okay? Or if you just want me to come and answer questions, hey, Saturday morning, I got everybody together after soccer practice. You want to come over? I'll be in there. Gotta let me know. Right. We can't make informed decisions if we don't have information. Right. My goal when I took this last year in August was to be as transparent as possible. Right. You want to know something, ask. I'll tell you. You may not like it. We may disagree. But I'm going to give you the information. I greatly appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Right. Coffee with the superintendent. I've got a key communicators meeting tomorrow night at 6 o'clock over in the uh, elementary school. Coffee with the superintendent on the 16th. Okay. And my office is always open. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. If you have any questions, I'll stay. Feel free to come up. Other than that, have a great evening, guys. Thank you.